Hey, good morning, Bear Creek Church. Glad that you're uh, tuning in today. Hey, we got a little different setting today. Justin Moreland, my videographer, and who puts all the service stuff together, is gone on vacation these next couple of weeks, and so um, he should be back next week, but I'm relegated to taping in my office. So welcome to my uh, office out in my garage. This is my uh, my uh, man cave out here. I'll give you a little tour if you haven't seen this before. I'm going to lift up the camera. So I built this right when we started the church. There's one side. I have books all the way around and some maps over there of the city as I pray for the city. I got my air conditioner there, so I'm set. Yeah, there we go. Anyways, so that'll probably make you sick. <laughs> probably probably make you dizzy. But I'm glad that you're checking in today. And sorry for maybe a little bit lower quality. And my head is a lot bigger on your screen today. So I'm sorry about that as well. You're going to have to look at my ugly mug. But... Uh, you can just close your eyes and listen too. That would be okay. A couple of announcements. Hey, our Bible Bowl uh, went down to Tennessee and they did fantastic. It's it was awesome. We had three teams that went down there, and Team One, made up of Madeline Hansen and and uh, Parker Hansen, they won the nationals, which was awesome. But the cool thing is, Team Number Two got second place. Team Number Two is Isaac Tronson, Enoch Parks, and Liv Tronson, and so they they did a great job. In fact, Team Two beat Team One in the tournament, but then when they got to the championship game uh team one had to win both games in order to win the, the national title so way, way to go bear creek uh and then bear creek uh, team number three they finished 11th place and they did a great job as well that's some of our younger players as they're learning how to play but we're proud of all of them and, and um i know they, they had a wonderful time and and um, they're bringing back two great big trophies and maybe we'll get a picture of that and show you next week sometime uh in so that's the competition it's a bible quizzing competition but then in the brain test where they actually have to do a written test madeline hansen plays first parker hansen plays second enoch parks plays third one two and three all from bear creek and then isaac tronson placed eighth and so way to go bear or bear creek bible bowl it's made up of some uh a homeschool family over in austin area and then in some marion church uh, the the hansers are from the marion uh, christian church but we're all together in that and and uh, they just did a great job and thanks for tracy and jerry and all the helpers that are uh, tracy and jb chamberlain which are the 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 leaders of the group and i know the trunsons are a part of that lee campbell's a part of that jason chamberlain's a part of that and all the volunteers that are part of that, uh, we just want to thank you for that. But way to go! That that was that's that's awesome. Second announcement is we got a, we sent out an email this week. The elders met earlier this week to discuss about the regathering again, and they really decided that we're going to wait until just the fall. I know everybody's anxious to try to get together, and but there's some churches that are hesitating a little bit, and we 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 made the decision based on a few few things. Uh, one of the main reasons is that we've ordered a bunch of, we really want to do a really good job being online. We're going to continue to be online when we start gathering again. And so we had to order some hardware for that. And unfortunately, because of COVID, everything's about four to six weeks out. So we haven't, some of that stuff hasn't come in yet. And we wanted to make sure to get that all set up and get the room set up. We might do a little bit of remodeling in our worship room just so that it's a little bit better ambiance with lighting and spacing. Um, and so we thought, let, let's just wait until that happens. Second is just summer schedules. There's just a lot of people that are gone. I'm going to be gone next weekend and then another week in August. I know Jeff is Jeff and Christy Urban are just coming back from a vacation. Justin and Amy Moreland are out and they're part of our team. And so in order to pull off some of these things, we needed those people around and everybody's doing their summer schedule. The third reason is that we did some research with some churches that are meeting in our community. And what we found out is when they reopen, very few people have come back, around 20, 15 to 20 percent. And so in a larger church setting of a thousand, they've already they've already, uh, only see about 200 to 300 that come back. And our smaller churches, I have a friend of mine that's part of a smaller church, about 200 people, and they only had 40 people came uh, show up for their service. And that's not including the 10 or 12 that were in the worship, or that is including the 10 or 12 that are in worship. So very small numbers. And mostly uh, people, there's not a lot of families that have been coming um, because there's not children's ministry going on right now and um, could be summer schedules but what they've noticed is a lot of families are staying home they're concerned about the virus as well so it's mainly couples middle-aged couples and maybe singles that have been attending and so the thought was that if it's just a small group of people of 20 to 25 people which is about our numbers at 20 percent well yeah, about 30 people then 
go through the cleaning and wiping down doors and changing chairs and all that stuff. Just that it's just a lot of work for a smaller group of people that could handle it in a small group setting until the fall. And so that was kind of the logic of that. And we we talked with we didn't do a poll of a lot of our church people. We talked with some of our main church folks that are very active and and uh, most if not about nine out of ten, let's see we probably probably about again about 20 percent that said they would come about 80 percent said that they wouldn't come so that could be eight out of ten people that we talked to and so we just we just thought gosh to do all that just to gather let's let's wait and let's um, let's wait until the fall when everything kind of calms down for the summer and then let's get back at it again so that we can have a better crowd um, the other thing is our air conditioning is really you know it's been hot this last week and our air conditioning isn't working so hot and so we thought if we're going to have to everybody's going to have to wear a mask it was mandated to do that so there's no options for that and then just that stuffy air up there it's just it's having a little hard time keeping up right now and of course we don't know if it's always going to be hot on a Sunday but that was one thought that we had and it's just not the Sunday experience you know if you're not going to be able to sing, if we're going to have our masks on, if we aren't able to interact and hug and handshake and, and stay in one space for a long period of time and then you have to leave right away, it just didn't seem like it's church yet. And so we're going to be patient about that. I know some are anxious about that, but I also know that some are anxious about coming as well because of their health conditions. And so with the fall, uh, with the, excuse me, with the South kind of exploding in some of the bigger states, uh, we're just going to be cautious. And what we're going to do is try to do the very best that we can online so that you can still meet together. And we really encourage people to get in small groups uh, and watch this together. Get with some neighbors or get with some other church folks. Jeff sent an email and there's a list of uh, names of people that are willing to host those groups. Give them a call. And if you don't know them, that's okay. All those people on that list are awesome people and you'd love each every, each and every one of them. And then get together with them and start building from there. I know that some of the people that have been doing that have really enjoyed that. And they spent some, you know, they watch the sermon, they critique it, <laughs> and then uh, they talk about it, and then they share a meal together, and they say they have wonderful, they've had wonderful times together. So that's what we're encouraging right now, uh, just to make sure that, um, you know, that we're trying to you know, stay connected the best way that we can. And um, but we'll hold on, and then we're, we're, our target date is the first week in September. We're going to meet in August again in the first week in August, and we'll talk more about it then. But I think uh, the elders are pretty confident that moving forward, that's best. And I listened to some podcasts of churches around the nation, and roughly about 60% of churches are open. So there's still some churches that haven't haven't opened up yet, and so that's what that's what we're going to do. In the meantime, here's what we're going to do, as far as us as staff. First. We're going to, well, first thing is to encourage you to get connected in the small groups, which, which is what we've I just mentioned. Secondly, um, what we're going to do is work on our worship space so that we can create some ambience. We're going to redo the lighting in there. We're going to get some stage lighting, get some sound system, kind of re rearrange that a little bit and get some media systems put into place. And we're setting up our uh, live broadcasts. And so we had to get some hardware for that. So we're going to be working on that. And the third thing is that we're going to develop the Sunday experience, meaning that we really want to improve it uh, so that we can work towards excellence. If we're going to do something online, that means we're, in a sense, exposing ourselves to people online, meaning that they're, we're revealing who we are. And so we want to do a very good job with that. And um, uh, people might decide to come to our church based on what they watch. And so we're going to work on developing that and getting better and better with our production and the content and uh, the sound and all those things. And then the last thing is, I made a commitment to pray for these next 40 days. Actually, there's 50, about 54, 53 days left before the fall. But I really want to seek the Lord to find out what he wants us to do because things have changed. And like it or not, church is going to be changed because of this COVID winter that we're a part of. It's changing us. And how we do church is changing. And instead of going back just to the same old, same old, and that's kind of what we long to, we have to face realization that it's not going to be the same thing. This might go on for a year after this, or maybe even two years until a vaccine. And so we just need to accept that. But how about use it as an opportunity to come up with some creative ideas to really do some pretty neat things. Now, I started the church based on a 40-day prayer time that I had. I really wanted to seek out what the Lord wanted me to do. And I spent 40 days in prayer just seeking him. And he revealed to me that he wanted me to start a church, the very church that we're a part of, Bear Creek, and to do the very things that we've been doing, working with under resourced people. And so I want to spend some personal time with the Lord. So in the next 55 days or 53 days or whatever it is to that beginning point, I'm going to spend 40 days seeking the Lord to find out how he wants us to move forward with church. And I pray that you pray with me as well. And you can do the same thing. Just spend some time seeking the Lord, jot down some ideas, maybe what he wants you to do. Um, 
but that's that's what we're going to be trying and um and, or not that's what i'm going to be doing and so i um and i'm excited to see how god's going to reveal himself to me so that we can move on in the future of our church okay so there that's a few announcements i know that's a lot of announcements and and i'm sorry for all that and um uh, but I hope that you're doing okay. All right. I hope that you are. Hope that you're enjoying your summer. We get a little, little break. Uh, maybe you got to the lake or to get away. Um, it's a good time to do that, just to get away and relax a little bit. I know I'm going to my nephew's wedding next weekend, and so we're pretty excited about that. There's going to be small, limited numbers, but we're excited to see our family. I haven't seen my mom and dad since um, Thanksgiving, so we'll see them at a distance, at, you know, six to eight feet away. Uh, but at least we'll get to see them, and so we're excited about that. Alrighty, let's get into the the message part of that. I, I, I suppose, you know, when we're in COVID, uh, a lot of us have been watching a lot of TV. And I don't know if you're sick of TV or not, or if, did you run out of series? Have you run out of series yet? <clears throat> you know, with COVID, uh, Hollywood is not able to make new movies either. And so they're going to be behind in some of the, the newer things that are coming out. So we're kind of relegated to watch the old movies that have already come out. But I, we've watched some really good movies. We watched Mr. Neighbors, Rob, or... Um, 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 uh, uh, Mr. Neighbor's Robberhood, <laughs> neighborhood. Scar, sorry about that. Um, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Gosh, can't get that right. Um, that was a really good movie, and it's, uh, it really talks about how nice uh, Mr. Rogers was. But it's really about a reporter that's really dealing with some stuff in his life, and how Mr. Rogers helps him deal with that, just because of his kindness. So I really recommend that. I know my wife likes watching the series Heartland. It kind of takes place on a horse farm up in Canada. It's a really good story. There's lots of things that are going on. It's a clean story. Um, there's some love story to it. There's some ten or, um, uh, tension in the story as well, but she really enjoyed it. In fact, she enjoyed it so much that she's re-watching it again. That's how much she enjoyed it. My mom and dad liked that series as well. I've been watching a number of series, but the one that I'm really stuck on right now is called um, Rust Valley Restoration. And it takes place in British Columbia, in Tappan, British Columbia, in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And in that area, it's one of the most unique car communities all over the world. There's just a lot of old cars in that area. And the story takes place with some colorful and charismatic people that decided to take a uh, to develop a shop to take old cars and restore them to mint condition or hot rods or whatever it might be. It's 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 it. Um, highlights Mike Hall. Mike used to be a, a business owner. He's an entrepreneur. He's kind of a big, tall hippie. He's got dreadlocks all the way down, but he's quite a character. But his passion and his dream was to start a shop that he can remodel cars or restore cars for the average person so that they can, so that they can afford them. He does that with his buddy, his, one of his best friends, Avery Scholl. And Avery's kind of a genius. He's the one that can fix anything. But his personality is so loud, and <laughs> and he's not scared to push back on Mike. And his laugh is one of the best laughs that you'll ever hear. And then uh, Mike Hall's son, Connor, is a part of that as well. And he's kind of the... He's kind of the common sense young guy out of it all. His dad is the dreamer and kind of floats here and there and, and sometimes doesn't realize what he gets himself into and his, and his son is common sense. At any rate, it's a really good show and it's they kind of go back and forth. Um, Avery and Mike kind of bicker like an old couple a lot of the time. Uh, they're just trying to get this business going. But what I love is the finished product. They'll take this old junky car. He has over 400 cars in his lot. And he'll walk around and he'll choose this one. The tires are gone. There's half the body there. It's all rusted out. And so they choose that because it's kind of a cool car, a cool older car. And so they'll bring that into the shop. And then at the end of the show, they'll reveal how they've remodeled it or restored it. And it's just awesome. It's phenomenal what they could do. It's really, I wish I had that. I know there's other score, other sh uh, story or um, shows that are like that, like American Restoration, where they take things or items and restore them back to its origin, original condition. But there's something about that that's just really, so I've been intrigued by that. I've been watching that. I love that transformation that takes place from this old rusty box of bolts into this beautiful car that people can enjoy. You know, the cool thing about that is that's exactly what God does in our life. Our life is beat up, our life is bruised, our life is banged up, and sometimes some of us get thrown off to the side and we're just sitting there in a heap of pile or a pile or a heap and we're dead. There's nothing there. We're we're lost and we can't figure out what's happening in our life. We're dead. But when God comes into our life, He all He comes and gives us life and He restores us back to the way that He wanted us to be from the very beginning. That that 
That's an unbelievable thing that can happen in your life. And so I want to talk about that today, how God restores us to his original idea of what humanity should be like. And we're going to be looking at a passage in, in um, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to ver be looking at verses 1 through 10 today as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. We call it the new normal. We have to live the new normal with this uh, COVID virus that we're dealing with. But when we become a follower of Jesus, everything changes. Our old life is done, and then we have a new normal that we live. And Ephesians really explains how we are to live as Christians. But it also explains how we get there and how God uh, transforms us so that we become the people that he wants us to be. And that's the section that we're going to be looking at today. So Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, all right? Let me read that for you. You can follow along. I'm not able to put verses up on the screen. Justin has all that technology. I'm sorry about that. So this might be a great opportunity to go grab your Bible, and then you can actually open up and follow along with me and look at the passages there. I'm reading from the New International Version. But here's Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgression and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it's a gift from God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't that a great passage? I like that passage. So prior to this section and what we talked about last week, Paul was challenging us to get to know God in a deeper way. Because once we get to truly know God, his personality, his purpose, his plan for us, his power, his passion, once we get to know God, that fills us with hope. Because we worship a God that's created everything and has the ability to, to sustain everything and also to change our lives. He says now, and he talks about Jesus. It all comes from Jesus. And he says now uh, we are seated with, or excuse me, that Jesus is the one that's provided that power for us so that we can live life. In fact, we have that same very power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that resurrects our dead life. And it talks about Jesus in that section before. He says, It's seated at the right hand of the heavenly realms, far above all rulers and authorities, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God placed all things under his feet. So it says, And he appointed him everything, even over the church. And so because of what Jesus has done, we have this hope. Now, the cool thing is that we share in that authority and that power. And that's what the pre previous section talked about, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. And that can raise our dead life. But it also means that we have authority over evil spirits. We have authority to carry out Christ's mission in the world because we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, which is an awesome thing. But notice now that we get into chapter 2. He says, but as for you, now he's talking about Jesus being elevated into the right position of honor. He says, but as for you, you were dead in transgressions. And so he's talking about where we were before Christ and how Christ transforms us. And so I'm going to look at this as the restoration road, the process that God took in order to restore us to his orig original vision of what he wanted humanity to be like. All right. And so we're going to look at what happened and then what Christ does for us and ultimately what it does uh, in the end about how God has this vision about who, who we are and what we can become. All right. So let's take a look at, I call it the restoration road. The first point is this. This is the condition, I call that. And the condition is this. I am spiritually dead. Ephesians 2 verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Do you know what trespasses are or transgressions? Trans, uh, transgressions are the fact that we stepped out of bounds and deviated from the right path. That we're going down something. We, we were supposed to go down here, but we deviated, we stepped off. These are the things that we do, but we should stop doing. 
Now, sin, on the other hand, are things that we do that fall short of God's standards. These are things that we should be doing, but we don't. Both of these words are very, very similar. The whole point is that we're lost in our transgressions and sins. We're dead in them. The word dead can mean a lot of things in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, dead is dead, right? But one of the things is that it means alienation and separation. God created the world and humankind for a purpose, that we would have a relationship with him. But like any relationship, it has boundaries. And when we stay within those boundaries, our relationship can be awesome. The same way with our marriage. When you stay within the boundaries of marriage, your relationship can be awesome. But if you break those boundaries, if you commit an adultery, um, if you deal with pornography, those are boundaries that are broken. Boy, those relationships can suffer. And the same happens with our relationship with God. When we don't follow his instructions for life, when we go outside those boundaries, there's alienation and there's suffering. And that's exactly what's happened. Humankind decided that they could do life, at least try to do life without God. And the punishment for breaking God's boundaries was separation from God and death. In Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah 59, verse 2, it says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That's a scary place to be, isn't it? When we're so far away from God that he doesn't even hear us. Now, on a side note, when we desperately reach out to God, when we're sorry for what we've done, absolutely his ears perk up and he's right there. But when we're in constant rebellion, there's no reason why God would listen to us because it doesn't matter to us. We don't care about God. Now, a dead person can't relate with anybody because they're dead, right? So they can't continue on in a relationship with another human being and they can't speak to another human being. And the same happens when we're dead spiritually. We're not able to communicate to God. We're not able to relate with God. And so we are dead. It's a scary place to be. And the other scary thing about it is that we can't do anything about it. We're stuck there. A dead person can't revive themselves, right? So we are spiritually dead. The word dead can mean powerless as well. Not only alienation, but powerless. Paul said by saying, he says, as for you, you were powerless in your trespasses or your transgressions and your sins. Now, either way, the point is rather bleak. It's kind of like in a boat ride. Christy and Jeff Urban and their family took off to help Chad and Angela Hewitt. They, Chad and Angela are part of our fellowship, and, and they moved out to um, the uh, Rochester, New York area. Angela's doing a fellowship out there in, in pediatrics. And so we uh, they're going to be gone for a year, year and a half, maybe two years, maybe for good. If they find a job somewhere else, we're really going to miss them. But Jeff, uh, Pastor Jeff and our staff took his family out there to help them move. And on the way back, they uh, went to Niagara Falls. Now they can only go to the United States side because the Canadian side, they won't let us in. The Canadians won't let us in because of COVID. But they were able to enjoy the Canadian or the, the at least the American side of uh, Niagara Falls. And um, now... Jeff was telling me about, they're telling about a lot of stories about people that have tried to go over those falls in a very, a variety of different vehicles, a variety of different means. And it was quite hilarious how some people uh, have tried to do that. But can you imagine being in a boat and you're up on top of the falls before it's coming down and you, you want to be a little adventurous. And so you get a little bit close and then you come back in again, come out out because you don't want to go over. But when you come back in, all of a sudden your engine quits and you can't get it started. And so you're going like crazy, but the current is bringing you closer and closer to it. And you're stuck. You're stuck. You can't go anywhere. They call that dead in the water. And the only way that you can be rescued is if somebody comes and helps you. Well, that's the image that Paul's trying to communicate to us here. That we're dead in the water. We're on Niagara River. And we're getting ready to go over the waterfall. That's the ultimate end, which is our death. And we're stuck. We're dead in the water. There's nothing that we can do. We need somebody else to come and help us out. What a scary place to be. But that's exactly where we were without God. Now, the second point that I want to make is called the cause. So the condition is that we're spiritually dead. Now, what's the cause of it? The cause of it is that we're addicted to sin. In Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Paul is saying that our condition is that we are powerless to stop and powerless to start because we are controlled by three forces. He talks about three things that we're controlled by. The first was the ways of the world. He's talking about the philosophies of life. We're influenced by the world. It could be economies, it philosophies, um, economics, policies. It could be social norms. It could be um, 
things that were past, whatever your culture elevates, but we're influenced by that. And sometimes it influences us in a negative way so that um, that we're, um, I've got to plug my thing and it's going to die here. There, sorry. Um, we're influenced in a negative way. And, and right now we're living in a culture that's really, really kind of crazy. And it's becoming more and more anti-God. But we're influenced by that. And we're influenced by the things that they call, say, that are very, very important. And it can lead us around the wrong, down, down the wrong path. Even though something's legal, it still, be, can, it still can be against God's will. And so we have to be careful about that. But that's one thing that dominates our life. <clears throat> Relativism, these philosophies of nar narcissism with the self-love, self-indulgence, individualism, secularism, scientific materialism, postmodernism, socialism, all these things influence us and can pull us away from the Lord. Now, the second force, it says, is the, is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now, he's talking about Satan. And during Paul's time, and Jewish people believe this as well, that the realm of evil spirits was between the ground and the sky. They were in the air. They were invisible. And so that's who he says. Satan is in charge of those that are around that area. He's talking about the spiritual realm, and especially the spiritual realm of evil. And on earth, that's Satan's realm, and he's doing his destructive thing. You know, his name means the accuser, and he accuses us of things. He makes us feel guilty for things, but his main weapon is lies. He just twists the truth a little bit. That's not going to hurt you. Go ahead and do that. Did the Christians say that you shouldn't do it? That's, that's baloney. You can do whatever you want to do. Besides, you like it. It's plenty. That's where you find your identity and your purpose, right? So go ahead and do that. That's Satan's lie. And his number one goal is to pull people away from God and destroy them. And so that influence, we have a spiritual being that's trying to influence us. He uses fear and deception and lies to control and manipulate people. Got to be careful about that. Now, the third force that's working on our life is how Paul uh, described it as cravings or desires. These are that internal drives. And these are, they can be really good things. A desire to have a relationship with a person. Um, uh, being attracted to someone. The desire to eat and taste good foods. Um, those things are, can be good, but they also can dominate your life. And we can become addicted to some of those des desires. And so all three of those, the world, <clears throat> Satan, and our internal. So the world is kind of the social, the outward. Uh, Satan is the spiritual, and then the internal battle, the desires. They're all trying to pull us away from God. And we get addicted to doing things that are against what God wants us to do because we want to do our own thing. We really want to be God ourselves. We don't want anybody else telling us what to do. And we think that <clears throat> in order for us to be truly happy, we must be allowed to do whatever we choose to do. Well, like I say many, many times, uh, try that with your kids once. Let them do whatever they want to do and see how that turns out. It doesn't turn out that well. But we are convinced ourselves that that's a must for us to truly find happiness. The point that Paul is trying to make is, on our own, we're in trouble. We're addicted. And we have the, this pressure from all sides drawing us away from God. We are spiritually dead in the water. So our condition is we're spiritually dead. And the cause is we're addicted to sin. Now, the third point I want to make is the consequences. The consequence is this, that I am condemned. That's not a good place to be. Ephesians 2 verse 3, like the rest, it says, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. My mom and dad manage a, a small apartment complex in our hometown, and they, they deal with a lot of characters. And a few years ago, there was a character that was living among them. It was a woman that was causing a lot of problems. And finally, my dad had to confront her about some of the things that she was doing. And she got visibly upset and physically upset. I mean, just kind of wailing and, and yelling and screaming. My dad just simply reached over and held her. She goes, just calm down, just calm down like that. And then she backed up and she goes, how dare you? You assaulted me. And then she just blew this. And so she pressed charges against my dad. Now, my dad wouldn't hurt a flea. He couldn't even put our dogs down on the farm. He had to get somebody else to do that. That's how compassionate he was when we had to take care of some of those uh, farm-like incident incidences. And so she took him to court. And so my mom and dad were really concerned about that. And you can imagine that. They didn't do anything wrong. Um, but you, they worried for months. And then when they showed up for court, you know, you don't, don't know what a judge would do or what this other person might do if they sue you for a lot of money. And so they waited patiently at the courthouse and that woman never showed up. And so they were, you know, nothing went forward. But just imagine being worried about that. And I know some of you might have been in court before. Some of you have heard the terms guilty and you had to serve out your sentence. I can't imagine what that's like to hear that term guilty. 
you know, because of our spiritual condition and because we're addicted to sin, it says, the Bible says we're guilty. We're guilty of breaking God's law, and therefore our punishment is that we are condemned. That's what God has to do. He gave us boundaries, and when you break those boundaries, there's consequences to that. We have laws in our society. We have to have boundaries in order to have a safe society. And when you break those boundaries, you have to pay the penalty. And the same is in our spiritual life as well. God gave us boundaries, and they're for us. They're for our benefit. They're for us to enjoy life to its utmost, to enjoy life to its fullest. But if we go outside those boundaries, then we're in trouble. And that's what's happened. We've all gone outside of those boundaries, and we are guilty. Now, some translations say that we are uh, children of God's wrath. In my translation, I use it's objects of, of God's wrath, but some translations have you are children of God's wrath. Now, just think of that. If you're a child, that means there's a relationship, that there's a close relationship. So you have a close relationship to God's wrath. That's scary. A close relationship. You're a child of God's wrath. Now, God's wrath can be a variety of things, but one of the things that it talks about in God's wrath in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, go back and read that passage, and it really describes where our culture is at today. It really does. It describes exactly what's going on in our culture. And in there, it says that God, or that humanity, gave up the worshiping the Creator God to worship created things. It could be idols, but it could be pleasures, it could be desires. And so it says in there, the wrath of God is... You know, when you think of wrath, I think of lightning bolts or, or tornadoes or, or hurricanes, just this things blowing after you. But the wrath of God, it says, is he gave them over to them. He gave them over to their sins, meaning he just lets you go on sinning, but he, it just, uh, uh, that's a punishment. That means you get so caught up into it, you become addicted to it, and it overwhelms you, it consumes you, and then you have to deal with the consequences. I just think that's fascinating. Now, that's wrath here that we experience. There's ultimately going to be the wrath in the end as well. In the Old Testament of the Bible, God's wrath is carried out by uh, nations as they carried out punishment. But I just think that's interesting that God's wrath is carried out by letting us do whatever we want to do. But that's his wrath. That means it's not a good thing, folks. And that's exactly what's happened. We are condemned. And we're condemned to live out this life the way it is. We're like dead men walking. Remember that sh movie that came out a few years ago? Dead men walking is a person going to death row. And that's exactly what we are for those of us, for those that have rejected God. We're walking on death row. But there's good news. And that's letter four, number four, the cure. I can be saved by God's grace. A woman got into an auto accident and died and found herself up in heaven. And she's standing there and she didn't know what was going on. And she looked up and there was Peter sitting behind a desk. And she walked in and said her name. And Peter says, all right. She goes, am I in heaven? She goes, yes. He says, how do I get in? get in? And he says, very simply, you just need to spell the word love. And she just took a deep breath. And he goes, oh, L-O-V-E. And he goes, congratulations. Welcome to heaven. And they embraced. And she was so excited about that. And Peter said, hey, could you do me a favor? I need to run for a second. And could you man the desk for a little bit? And you probably won't have a lot of people show up. Just tell them what I told them. That's all you need to do. And then I'll be back in a little bit. And so she said, I'll be glad to do that. So she sat at that desk. And all of a sudden, poof, there's her ex-husband that showed up. Her ex-husband. And she was going like, what's he doing here? And he was looking around going like, hey, where am I? And she looks and there's his ex-wife and he goes, oh, uh, where am I? And she says, you're in heaven. He goes, really? He goes, how did I get here? She goes, I don't know. He says, well, what do I need to do to get in? And she says, oh, you're just supposed to spell a word. And he goes, well, what the word? what's the word? She says, Czechoslovakia. Thank goodness that we're not allowed into heaven based on our spelling, right? In fact, there's nothing that we can do in order to get into heaven. It's got to be something that only God does. And that's part of the story that we've been covering here today. Ephesians 2, verse 4 through 9. It says, but, you know, that's our condition, and that we're, um, that we're addicted, and then we're condemned. It's not a very good space to be in, right? But it says, but... Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgression. It is by grace that you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace 
expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not something that you've done yourself. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Thank God for grace. When you ask people, do you think that you're good enough to get into heaven? Or do you think that you're going to get into heaven? Some people think, well, I think I've done enough good things. <clears throat> Hold on a second. I just, <laughs> my computer just paused. This is my great technology here. There, I'm back. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry about that. This is what it means to be a... Uh, not very well versed in, in video, but for some reason my computer went, turned weird. All right, we're back. Here we are. So getting back to this, do you think that you can go to heaven? People think if we're just good enough. But what happens if you're one short? <laughs> what happens if you get up to heaven and go, oh, the Lord goes, man, you know what? If you just would have, if you just would have helped that lady in the elevator before you died, you would have been good, but you're one short. Well, that's not exactly how we get in. That's not a good way to get in, is it? <clears throat> You know, in baseball, you know what a great hitter is in baseball? It's about 400. That means out of 10 times, you get a hit four times. That means you miss 60% of the time. And that's a great hitter in baseball. But in order to get into heaven, you have to hit 100%. You've got to hit 1,000. You've got to hit 10 out of 10. And we don't do that because we fall short of God's glorious standard. We never measure up. And so that's why we have to be perfect to get in. And we can't get perfect. So we can't do it on our own. We can't get to heaven. We are spiritually dead, we are stuck in sin, and as a result, we are already condemned to die. Now, Jesus' disciples responded, then who can be saved? And Jesus once said, well, with man this is impossible, but with God anything is impo anything is possible. And that's exactly what it is. In Ephesians 2, verse 4, 4, 5, let's continue on. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. But God... Isn't that cool? I just think that's one of the most powerful phrases in all the Bible. We're lost. We can't do anything on ourselves, but God can come in and help us. And it says he does so for a variety of reasons. First, because of his great love. That word for love is agape love, which is unconditional love. It means that we don't deserve that love, but he gives it. But that love also means it's a love that seeks the highest good in the one loved. Isn't that awesome? Because of his great love. And in that, that sentence or in, in that context, their emphasis is on great. This unbelievable love that God has for us. That's why he came to save us. It also talks about that he is rich in mercy. That mercy is loving kindness. It's showing pity to someone that's struggling in life or that's suffering. God has mercy on sinners who are suffering from the calamity of sin in our life. And it says that he's rich in it. That means he's full of mercy. He has a lot of mercy. He's a gazillionaire in mercy. That's how much he has available to us. And it's by his grace, because of his love and because of his mercy, <clears throat> he saves us by his grace. Grace means unmerited favor. You don't earn it. He simply gives it. Even even when we're not the nicest people in the world. But when we feel bad for what we've done, the Bible says, and when we recognize what Jesus has done for us, and then we see that he died for us and that he rose again and that if we place our faith in him, he will forgive us. When we believe that, even when we're doing some ra ra nasty, rotten things, when we finally come to that realization and say, Lord, I am so sorry, that's when his grace pours out into our life. We don't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But he gives it to us. And it says that we receive it by faith. Faith means trust. That we trust that we're forgiven because of what Christ has done. We trust what God is doing. And we trust that we can do life or that we can live life the way that God wants us to live. That's what faith is. Here's the thing, folks. We can't save ourselves. We can't. And we can't do life on our own. So quit trying to do that. We're stuck. We need God's help. And because of his grace... He makes us alive again in Christ. That's where the transformation starts taking place. And that's the last thing I want to talk about is the change, okay? So we talked about the condition, the cause, and being condemned, but there's a cure, and now this is what happens. This is the transformation. This is the new car coming out of that, coming out of that um, garage after it's been restored. This is what God does. 
In verse 10, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That word handiwork can be translated uh, masterpiece. That word is only used twice in the New Testament of the Bible. Now, there's a couple things about that. First, it is God's work, God's handiwork. It comes from God. It's not something that we've done, but it's his handiwork. It's his creation. It's his design. It's his masterpiece. You've seen some of his masterpieces pieces if you've been to the Grand Canyon or the Rocky Mountains or the Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls. I've been to Victoria Falls. They're in, in Africa on the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe. Unbelievable. They're 1,500 meters wide. And this rush of water that comes in is so overwhelming and so awe-inspiring. You can't help but praise God because of it. That's God's creation. And it says here that we are God's masterpiece. And we really are. When you look at humanity, even though we do dumb things... We're pretty remarkable, right? But God created us in a... And this is... He's changing us into a masterpiece now from being dead spiritually. And because of what Christ has done and because of his grace, he transforms us into this beautiful masterpiece. A masterpiece is a value. That says that you are valued by God. you got to remember that when you're feeling down about yourself. You are extremely valued by God. Now, the emphasis is on God again, that he's done this for us. We've done nothing in order to earn that. You know, I've seen this transformation in people's lives. When we're baptizing people, when they make a commitment to Christ, they go down in the water. That symbolizes that you're dying to that old life and you're coming back out of the water. That symbolizes new life. And I've seen the people's expressions on their faith. There's nothing magical that happens in that water. What's magical, what's powerful is what God's doing to that person's heart. And you come out a masterpiece. You come out restored. How exciting is that? Now, we're not saved by good works, that passage says, but we are saved to do good works. So once we are saved, we are so grateful that then we want to go live the life that God wants us to live. Now, good works can be living a moral life. It could be helping a neighbor. It could be sharing your faith. It could be giving money to the poor. It's anything that focuses on pleasing God and serving people. Those are good works. That's what we were created for. Now, part of the good works is that we get to help God restore a lost and broken world. God created us. He restores us. And now we get to go out and help restore those uh, things that are lost. Humanity, systems, economics, whatever that might be. We get to be a part of that. That's Christ's mission in the world for us. Most importantly, it's about restoring broken lives. Now, we're in the process of restoring homes. That's one of our calling cards. That, actually, that's who we are as Bear Creek Church. We worked with under-resourced people, and uh, we love fixing up cars. That's Jeff's passion is to, not cars, houses, uh, fix up houses, and uh, he dreams, I think he thinks about that all day long and all, all night long. But some of the first houses that were restored, um, Johnson, I think Johnson was the first one out there in 11th Avenue. I see that's for sale. I just noticed that, but that was one of our first houses. But the transformation that's take place in the trailer park, go online to our Facebook page. So go to Facebook and type in Bear Creek Christian Church, and then that Facebook page will come up, and then look for videos. And uh, there's a video of the restoration of that doghouse that was given to us. It shows you a before and after picture. It's pretty, quite remarkable. And so we love doing that so that we can create a home for people to live in. And... Um, it's quite exciting, and that's really, really important. But it's not as important as restoring people's lives as well. And that's what we get to do on campus. Um, we get to be a part of helping people kind of get back on their feet, um, to, to kind of find a stable place to live, and then we'll come in and support them the best that we can. And then we want to resend them out, to send them back out, maybe to get their own house someday down the road. But that's the exciting part of being on campus, is that we want to create that as a, a transformation center. I think it's rather cool because the college... Called, uh, called that street that goes right through campus, Restoration Road. And uh, that's exactly what we our vision is for that campus. We're going to use that later on down the road. Maybe I, even if we ever change our church somewhere down the road, the name of our church, Restoration Church would be kind of a cool name. And Restoration Road would be the path that people can come along on. But it's all based on what God has done for us. He is the one that saves us. He transforms us. And now we get to be in the business of transformation as well. And there's nothing more exciting than that. Well, here's the bottom line, folks. I'm almost done. So uh, there's an old saying that some think that comes out of the Bible. Some think that the saying is this, that God helps those who help themselves. Some people think that came out of the Bible. That doesn't come out of the Bible. That came out of Greek, Greek philosophy or Greek thinking from the ancient Greeks. What the Bible does teach is that God helps those that are helpless. We were helpless in our sin. And Jesus came into the world 
to rescue us. And he went to the cross, died for our sins so that we can be forgiven of our sin. And then he rose from the grave, which means that death can't even stop us. And it verified that he is God, that he is the one that God sent into the world because he's the only one that went to the other side and came back to tell us what it's all about. And therefore he is seated in the heavenly places in the right place of honor. And when we look through what Jesus has done in God's plan, the new life, the old life is found in verse one through three. And the new life is found in verse 4 through 6. But the old life, I'm just going to compare the two different things, okay? So on one side, we were dead. But on the other, we are alive in Christ. On one side, we are enslaved. But because of Christ, we are enthroned with him. On one side, we are objects of God's wrath. But with God, we are now objects of God's grace. <clears throat> on one side, we walked among the disobedient. On the other, we walked with Christ. On one, we are under Satan's dominion and in union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Sorry, my computer is shut down again. I'm not sure why it's doing that. There, back again. Make, wrecking my point. But do you see those comparisons? We were dead, but now we are alive. We are enslaved, and now we're enthroned. We were objects of God's wrath. Now we're objects of God's grace. We walked among the disobedient. Now we walk with Christ. And we are under Satan's dominion. And now we're in union with Christ Jesus. That's pretty awesome. That's the transformation that takes place. And here's another cool thing. Do you know that verse 1 through 10 is one sentence in the Greek? It's one sentence. And there's two Greek or there's two verbs that modify the or that or that drive that sentence. It's seated or raised up and seated with. All this is that God raised us from the dead and he sits us right next to him in his throne. That's how valuable and precious we are. How awesome is that? Isn't that awesome? Think about that. We were raised up from the dead spiritual life. That's cool in of itself. But we are now seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. That's a position of honor and power. That's our position in Christ. What a transformation. That's that beautiful Camaro that comes out of that garage or that beautiful Trans Am or that beautiful 1965 Mustang that I dream about uh, once in a while. That's us. We have been transformed and we come out brand new people and God raises us up and he seats us in his place of honor. So here's, here's kind of a bottom line statement. Your purpose in life is to be transformed from what you used to be into someone that God has always meant for you to be. That's pretty cool. You know, the fun part of Rust Valley restoration is the finished result. In fact, you're tempted to fast forward in order to see what that car looks like. And that's the exciting part of our relationship as well. God takes a sinner far from God and he transforms us. It's his handiwork. We are his work of art. We are his masterpiece. Now, are you tired of driving around in that old life of yours, that old clunker, that old rusted out life that you've been living? There's hope for you. God can transform you and turn you in to a masterpiece, a classic. You can do that when you believe in Jesus and when you repent of your sin, feel sorry for what you've done and ask God to forgive you. When you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and as you are baptized into Christ. That's how we express our faith. We place our trust in God. And when we do that and follow through with those steps, that's when God forgives us and that restoration process begins. Isn't that awesome? That's good news that we can hold on to in the middle of the bad news that we're experiencing today. You can be transformed into a masterpiece. Well, let's end our time together with communion. And we'll go right back to that verse in Ephesians verse 4 through 9. Because of God's great love for us, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ. Notice how many times it uses this with Christ or in Christ. With Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, by, it's by grace that you've been saved. And God raised us with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not from something that you've done. It is a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. It is with Christ. And that's the only way that we that transformation can take place is because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so communion, 
as we're reminded each and every week as we celebrate it, brings us back to Jesus. It's so important that we don't forget about what Jesus has done for us. The bread represents his body that was given for us as a, uh, uh, as a substitute to take on our punishment. God's wrath poured out on him so that we can be forgiven. It also paid the penalty of our sin. And so we thank God for Jesus' body. And then the juice represents the blood that was shed, a sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And so if you get your elements here, and I'll pause just for a second, you can put, click pause. Give you a moment to do that. And as you gather your elements, take a piece of bread, Jesus' body that was given for us. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into the world, becoming a human being, and suffering on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus. In the blood of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for offering a sacrifice, for taking on the nails and the lashings, to show how much you love us and to pay our price. We're so sorry that you had to do that, but we're so grateful that you did that in our place. Thank you, Jesus. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment that we get to share together and the Lord's Supper that we get to share together. Remind us of what Jesus has done for us and how He's provided the avenue of transformation. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. And thank you that you're now seated at the right hand of the Father. And Lord, thank you for sending Jesus into the world to help us raise up from being spiritually dead, forgiven of our addiction of sin, and given a, a position of honor right next to Jesus at your side. Lord, thank you for transforming our lives. Continue to work on us. Help us be the people that you want us to be. Help us live the mission out to help other people experience that transformation as well. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks for um, putting up with my video today. And um, I hope that you're able to see it and hear it. And I hope that you learned something today. Hold on, all right? Be patient. Um, life is different today. But we're going to make it. We're going to be positive about it. I look at it as a challenge. Early on in COVID, I was kind of feeling down. But right now, I am really feel inspired and challenged that this is an opportunity for us to do something different and to be the church in kind of the new normal that we're a part of. So pray to God that way. Look for opportunities that we can serve Him, even though we're limited in that. Right? And grow closer to Him. Spend time in His Word. Spend time in His prayer. Get together with others from church and small groups or go out for lunch and just share life together. But we're still together, in it together. And until then, we'll see you next week. And I hope they have a blessed week this week, okay? God's blessing on y'all. Hang in there. If I can get this.